me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This is part 3 of a series entitled, Life is a Battlefield. Life is a Battlefield. And I entitled this message today, The Standard Issue. When you go into the military, they give you standard issue. Your uniform, and they give you your, your weapon. It's a standard issue. So standard issue, we have the divine panoply. Not monopoly, but panoply. P-A-N-O-P-L-Y. It is the Greek word for full body armor. It was given to a Greek soldier, a Roman soldier, which consisted of a helmet, consisted of a breastplate, which consisted of a shield, and a sword, and a lance, and proper shoes, what we would call combat shoes of those days. Basically, they will be sandals, and the straps will go all the way to your shins, to your kneecaps, and under the soles of the sandals, there were something called hobnails, which made it look like cleats, so they would have traction when they would fight, they would not slip like the average sandal. And that was basically the standard issue to a soldier. Paul the Apostle's theme is that, is that we need to put on the full armor of God. He says to us that in verse 10 of chapter 6, he says, Finally, my brethren, put on the might of Christ. Put on the strength of God. And I shared with you two weeks ago that this is a divine strength. This is not brute strength. This is not muscular mass. This is not muscles. This has nothing to do with with intellectual ascent. It has nothing to do with having political clout. This strength is divine given. It is God appointed. God gives you that strength when you go through difficult times. We can't explain it. We cannot articulate it. All we do is just receive that strength that God gives you. It's the strength to control you, to modify you, to give you the sustenance that you need when other things cannot hold you or sustain you. And it's the strength of God that He gives it to you. Paul reminded us, as I alluded to a scripture where Paul said, I'm going through changes. It's a thorn on my sight, which he speaks about abrasion or he speaks of discomfort. And he says, I had this thorn on my sight. And it's an agent, it's an agent of Satan that buffets me. He says, I asked God, I pleaded with God three times to remove this thing from me. And three times my God said, my grace is sufficient. For I will make, he says, for I will make perfection in weakness. Paul said, therefore, i rather be weak that the strength of God may be in me. For when I am weak, I am strong. And, and that is, that is a, 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 a paradox that the world doesn't understand. It is a paradox that you and I didn't understand before we became Christians. How can you become weak and you become strong? How can you lose your life and then find it? It doesn't make sense. It's a paradox. But only those that listen to the truth of Jesus, it's not a paradox. We understand it very well. When you and I become weak, we become helpless. And men's extremities are always God's opportunities. So weakness, weakness is a good opportunity for us to become strong in Him. Because as long as you feel yourself strength, as long as you have the ability, mobility, and the availability, you'll rule your host. You will be the, you will be the, the ship captain. You will do whatever you want to do. It's when the rudder goes out. It's when you run out of gas in that ship. And no matter how big you are in that bridge, without any fuel, without any rudder, you're not going anywhere. And then you realize that you're helpless. And when you become helpless, and then God comes in and gives you that strength. And then you realize, my God is a God of strength. How do you know? Because when I was weak, He came when I was at my weakest. When I was at my lowest, God came. This is the power that He speaks about. So He says, be ready with the strength. Because He mentions in verse 11, in verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So in that, we spoke last week, that Paul speaks about a spiritual conflict. This is a spiritual battle. This is not a physical battle. It's not people with a physical altercation where you see the blows coming in, and it's flesh against flesh, blood against blood. It's not that kind of a war. And so many people want to fight spiritual wars with physical weapons. And Paul says, we have no physical weapons against this kind of war. This war is initiated by an opponent called Satan, the devil. Now, 
we are told that the devil uses wiles. You ever heard of Wiley the Coyote? Beep, beep. And Wiley the Coyote is, is always trying to get that bird and make him into a pollo loco. <laughs> but if he ever catches them, and then we will not have any more cartoons. He's always unsuccessful. But he's always trying to get that little bird. But the little bird is too fast. The little bird is very attentive. He has more schemes than the wily coyote. You see, Satan, he gets too much credit. Flip Wilson used to be a comedian in the late 60s. He used to get dressed as Geraldine. Remember Geraldine? And she used to have a phrase, The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Everything she blamed on the devil. You see, she portrayed a girl who was a Christian church goer. And she blamed everything on Satan. Everything. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And sometimes I believe that we give Satan too much credit. Satan doesn't do everything. Sometimes we do it ourselves. We do what Satan does. So why will Satan want to do anything? We're already doing his bidding. We're already doing his work. We're already cussing people out. We're already fighting. We're in violence. We're in chaos. We're in confusion. We're destroying. So why would Satan want to help you? You're doing it yourself. And sometimes we give him too much credit. Sometimes circumstances, issues, death or illness or inconvenience, fractures in life will always bring you to the point where you believe that it's a satanic attack. No, it's just called life. In this life, Jesus said, you will have tribulations. So some people think erroneously that becoming a Christian, you're going to be exempted from pain, from sorrow. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Today's churches are very popular today. Churches are so popular that people in mass are coming in. And all they're telling you is that take out the negative feelings off of you. You're always concerned about hating people. Don't hate people. Love people. Just take out the negative things off of you. Don't worry about your life. Just look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, I want to make peace with you. And you're sitting there like, what? You mean you telling me that I'm a good person? That I have some negative things in me and I have to put the negative and, and help my, 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 my neighbor and thank God? What about my sin? You see, I've been sniffing glue. You see, I just left my wife. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a crack addict. I steal from my boss. What about that? Are those negative problems? Are those negative things? I think the Bible calls it sin. And the Bible says the sin separates us from God. So why don't you just preach it like it is and say, listen, the reason why you're encountering this is because there's no relationship with God. Your sin has separated you from God. You need God to intervene through Jesus Christ to become your rescue, your redeemer, your savior, your deliverer. And Jesus can take away that anxiety from you and reconcile you back to God. That's what we need. And yet that's not what they preach. Every single morning, every Sunday. You okay? I'm okay. Just love your neighbor. Why are you always negative all the time? And you walk away feeling good. That that was good. He didn't tell me I was a mean person. He told me I was good. I was was all right. No. We have personal issues. We got things in our life. We got crises. We, we had bankruptcies, either financial or marital or business or emotional bankruptcies. We have things in our life that are not right. And we have all kinds of people telling you what's right. Who is right? The politicians tell you one thing. Larry King tells you another thing. Dr. Phil tells you another thing. Dr. Ruth tells you another thing. Dr. Laura tells you another thing. And Dr. Joe Pelota and he still like tells you another thing. So who are we to believe? There's so many talking heads telling you what's truth and what is not. And Satan likes to confuse. So Paul the Apostle says, listen, put on the armor of God. So with that in mind, I ask you, whose armor is it? Yours or God's? God's. It's not yours. So what is that armor? Is it really a helmet? You know, it's not. Is it really a shield? Is it really a a breastplate? No, it's not. We're not even going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what is signifying each. It is the helmet of what? Salvation. It is the shield of what? 
of faith. Shod your feet with the preparation of what? The gospel. Gird yourself with what? With the truth. And so what is this armor of God? Oh, when you look at Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14, we know what that is. Paul the Apostle says, Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, the armor is Jesus Christ? Absolutely. The Bible says that we were saved by grace through what? Faith. We are told that the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it, in the gospel, is the power of who? Of God. For in it, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God. So it's righteousness, faith, and the power of God. The gospel. And then he says, also, our faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for but not seen. Faith. You believe in Jesus Christ. You remember that day when you say, you didn't even know how to pray. You remember that? You remember, I don't know where you were at. In jail probably. Or in your car. Or you were there in your, in your, in your house crying. As you, kid, you cleaned the kitchen and you heard a message and you came to Christ. I get emails from people. I get emails from people who says, man, I was listening to you, man. I was driving in the freeway, minding my own business, and I heard you. I thought you were Cheech and Chong. <laughs> so I put you on because you have an accent. I said, accent? I don't have an accent, eh? I have, you have an accent. But I was mesmerizing what you were saying. He says, and God got a hold of me. And right there and then, something happened to me. That I had to go to church that night. And I thank God. Because nobody would have made me go to church. He says, but how you said it and what you said on the radio. You see, it's not me. It's not the accent. What it is, is the power of God's word. The word of God comes in. comes into your heart. There's no other receptacle. It just comes in. For the Bible says the word of God is sharper than two-edged sword. It's alive and active. Able to penetrate between the bone and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of everybody's heart. You see, the truth comes in and you say, Wow, what hit me here, man? This is more powerful than my mother. This is more powerful than the boyfriend I wish I had. This is more powerful than Mrs. Decker, my junior high school teacher. Oh, (laughs) This is more powerful than my culture. This is more powerful than my coaches. This is more powerful than all the girlfriends I had. This is more powerful. Than any experience I ever had. Why do I want to feel like getting up and say, I'm a sinner? I didn't want to get up. It was the power of the Lord. It was the power of God's word. So Paul the apostle was saying, there's a battle going on. It's a spiritual battle. It is not a physical battle. We can't see the enemy. The Bible says that we're, we're fighting against evil forces. Against powers of darkness and rulers in darkness. Do you believe, as I ask you a question, do you believe that we're living in evil times? Yes or no? Do you believe there's evil people in our society? Do you believe there's people in your own community? Do you believe there's evil people in your, in your own neighborhood? Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to go to the glossary. I can just point one that's sickening and it really gets me so upset. How can someone... 21-year-old young man breaks into a senior citizen's complex and brutally, brutally rapes a 91-year-old woman. Brutally. And you think, that's insane. No, that's not, that's not insane. Drinking beer in the morning with a glazed donut, that's insane. But doing what he did, Doing what he did is, is that's bar, not, not even barbaric. At least barbaric is a little class. This is evil. This is devilish. This is demonic. And there's so many demonic things going on in our own communities. And then we say, well, that's part of our social ills. No, Paul says, there's a spiritual battle going on. Be firm, be strength in the, in the strength of God, in His might, not your own. Put on the full armor of God. Put on Jesus. 
And so he speaks about, about the truth of God. He first he says in verse 14. He says, well, let's, let's, let's read in verse 13. Now nah, let's go to verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we fight against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, because there's a battle going on, spiritual battle, Paul says, take up the whole panoply or the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now, do you understand? What is the object of this armor? For what? To fight? No. For what? Just to stand. What is that called? Resistance. Resistance. You resist the slapping. You resist the push. You resist the temptation. It's just resisting. It doesn't feel good, but you hold on. Remember, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. You too have hobnails in your shoes, and you're standing firm. And no matter what comes, what? Is that your diagnosis, doctor? Yes, it is. What? you leaving me for another woman? You understand what I'm saying? Do you really? It comes. It comes. It comes. What? What happened? No, it can be. And you just feel like giving up. Am I talking to you? Am I talking to you? Oh yeah. Life. It happens. You got to resist what's coming up. You got to be ready. You got to hold on. Paul the Apostle says, you got to stand. No, nowhere in the Bible does it say, go look for Satan, go kick his butt. Nowhere. Nowhere. You got to respect. He's a schemer. You can't fight him. What are you going to do? Hey, I took karate. He'll take you and your mama and take everybody. <laughs> karate or no karate, he'll mess with you. He was in the garden from the beginning. He knows he's a schemer. He's a fighter. And he, he takes it like a shark. He smells blood. Your weakest point? See, he's called the accuser of the brethren. You see, when we fail, and most of us do fail, there hasn't been a day in my life as a Christian man, there hasn't been a day where I get up in the morning, and then at night after everything, I'm about to crash for the night, I can never say, Oh, wow, today was a holy day for me. No, unless I was under anesthesia for the whole day. But there has never been a day in my life, there has never been a day in my life where I can say, Whew, Pancho, we kick butt today. Just by thinking that, I already failed. There's never been a day. Every night, I thank God. And I ask for forgiveness. And every morning, the Bible tells me that His mercies are new every single morning. Why would God put that there? Now, now you know. Because we got to take them every single day. We need His mercy more than ever because we fail God. But here He's speaking about going through changes. Have you gone through a difficult time as a Christian? Have you ever questioned God by questioning Him? Why? <laughs> Why? Maybe you have not. But that's the first instinct of many people. Why us? Why us? Why us? Or maybe you don't vocalize it, but you do exercise it silently. So the worst things. Because you have an attitude. Well, I don't want to say nothing, but you have an attitude. I hate that person, but I'm not going to tell him. You are telling him. You're telegraphing by your attitude. You're telegraphing by your posture, by your lack of response. I don't want to tell you. You're already telling me. You hate me. Look at your look at your look. Look at your posture. Look at your faces. Look at your lack of cooperation. You're mad dogging at me. You don't have to tell me. You're, you're already broadcasting it to me. You're telegraphing that to me. And that's how we are with God. You know, I'm not questioning God, you know, but you know. It's like we're angry at God. And all of a sudden Satan comes along and says, Yeah, yep, God doesn't love you. There's no God, man. It's only you, man. Doesn't love you. You really believe there's a God? 
You really believe that you're in darkness and he's going to come to the rescue? <laughs> How long have you been like this? How long? Hey, what did the doctor tell you? That, that they found something else with your wife? Oh, Jehovah Rapha, right? Jehovah nothing, man. See, he can't do that to us. Satan is messing with Millie. He's messing with the wrong person. Wrong person. I don't know. I, Satan may be smart, but sometimes I think he's dumb. Why Millie? Millie's a fighter. Millie's here. I'm not trying to boast about my wife. I'm not trying to do that, man. I'm not trying to boast about my wife. I prefer for her to stay home because she can drive. She already had an accident. She can drive. So I drive for her. She can drive. But she wants to be here. I said, just go in there, just go in there right now, lay down in my office in the couch. Just lay down. Okay, okay, okay. No, she leaves and she's answering the phone right now. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have communion tonight. <laughs> and I'm thinking, dude, don't mess with her. Because she's not going to go out there whimpering. <laughs> no, she's a fighter. She has faith. She has commitment. She has loyalty. She goes, I've been a Christian too long to understand what is happening. You see, my faith wants to be shaken. My salvation wants to be questioned. My devotion for God wants to be disrupted. That's not going to happen. And this is what Paul says. We need to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with what? What's the first thing? Truth. What is the truth? The Bible says, as Jeremiah said, Jehovah, the Lord God, is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Moses said this in Deuteronomy 32.4. God is the truth and without injustice. He is righteous and upright. He is a rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. And now the Bible says that the Word of God became flesh. The Word of God became flesh. And that flesh dwelt among us. And we are told in John chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus embodied that truth. You see, in chapter 8 of John, we have some critics of Jesus. And I mean critics in the worst sense. If you're here this morning or this afternoon, and you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, but you've seen a friend of yours, you've seen a neighbor of yours, you've seen a family member of yours, you knew that person before, and now you see that person, and you realize something happened to that neighbor, something happened to that family member, something happened to your son, to your parents, something happened, because they saw the change immediately. Because they know you. And then when you, when you go back as a Christian, you don't have to tell people you're a Christian. Again, you're broadcasting your Christianity just by your response, your action, your denial of certain things. Your eyes are open. You don't want to do those things anymore because it brings chaos, confusion. And all of a sudden you're making decisions that are called judicial reasoning decisions. In other words, you're evaluating what you're going to do. And your parents and your neighbors, they knew you never had that before. And they knew something is happening. You're born again. You're born again. Something happened to you. And you want to let them know, listen, Christ changed me. It was His life. And, and if you are one of those witnesses, you know that's what happened. The same thing with the critics. They saw Jesus raising the dead. They saw Jesus giving sight to the blind. They saw the paralytics walk. He saw the lepers being cleansed. And yet, they did not want to believe. In fact, they accused them of him having a demon and of being a Samaritan. They said, is it right in our assessment, our opinion, that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? You're the king of Beelzebub or you're the lord of the flies. And Jesus said, how can Satan fight against himself? What I am doing by my works, he says, Satan will not like it. How can Satan be destroying himself? And he goes on to say to them, he says, listen, I come from my father. And they said to him, our father is Abraham, meaning we're Jews to the bone. And then Jesus says, no, you're not. 
He says, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. The devil was the murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he has been a liar and he's a father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? I tell you why you do not believe me. Because you are not hearing my voice. What did he mean by that? You remember Pilate? Poor Pilate. He thought he had Jesus as a victim. He thought that Jesus was basically being in court. But it was the other way around. Pilate was in court. Pilate said, I find no fault with this man. Crucify him. Why? What evil has he done? I find no fault in this man. He's not guilty. Kill him. So finally, he had to have a conversation with Jesus. And he went in the back with Jesus and he asked Jesus, Are you a king? Are you a king? And Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Ah. Pilate angry said, What is truth? And he walked away. Never gave a chance for Jesus to say what he has said to multiple people. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He who believes the truth, receives the truth, walks the truth, shall be free, and the truth shall set him free. The truth. But today, that is questionable. Today we don't have truth. What we would call that fundamental truth. Truth is what you believe. You believe the world is round? Well, you know what? We believe it's square. You think abortion is murder? I just think it's convenience. You call it shacking up? We call it cohabitation. You call them burritos? We call them breakfast wraps. So what is absolute truth? Did you know that before you became a Christian, you had some kind of truth according to your own standard? You see, I had a truth. The truth was, God created everything, right? He created the herbs. And I just felt that you can use them in cooking, or you can smoke it. That was my faith. I'm not bothering anyone, man. I grow it, I cultivate it, I cut it, I break it down, I smoke it, and I sell some on the site. I'm not hurting anyone. I only sell it to dopers just like myself. It's not chemicals, you see. This is organic. This is of God. That's what I used to say. And I believed in it. Because when I would smoke weed, I would get very happy. Yeah, I just, hey, they should market this thing. This is great, man. The only thing is you gain weight because you're eating a lot. But then you realize that That's all you're doing all your life. And then you realize that that's an artificial laughter. The only way to laugh and the only way to alter your mood is by smoking this smelly thing. Then you realize, well, well, that's something wrong, but I can't get away from it. This is my life. You know, let live and let live. That was my philosophy until Christ came into my life. And then all of a sudden my eyes were open like it opened yours when you came to Jesus Christ. And then you realize that we were blinded from the truth. The Bible said that Satan blinds men from the truth. And so Paul says when you're going through difficult times, when we go through the spiritual battles, that's one of the first things they're going to be questioned, your truth. Is there truth about God? And Jesus said, I am the truth. But like I shared with you, there are many mediums. There are a lot of talking heads in our society. You have the media. You have television. You have movies. You have the Hollywood, you have magazines, you have newspapers, you have the radio, you have the internet, you have web bloggers. That's just one facet of truth. And then you have the politicians, whether they're Democrats, whether they're Republicans, whether they're independents, whether they're right wing or they're left wing or they're wigged out. But there they are. They want to tell you what is the truth. And then you have the celebrity gurus. You have Dr. Phil. You have Dr. Ruth, Dr. Laura, you have Ann Landers, you have Oprah, you have Deepak Chopra, you have, you have Jerry Springer in his commentaries. And then you have Rush Limbaugh. 
We used to have Sister Cleo, but she's busted now. You know that. She couldn't foresee that she was going to get busted. She can see and tell your future. And she goes, oh, ma, you're going to have a lover. I can see him now. But she couldn't see there were cops were there to arrest. They're still doing time for taking money. Sister Cleo. What else? Well, we have the beautiful people. You have Barbara Streisand. You have YouTube Bonos. You have Michael Moore. You have Sting. You have Bruce Springsteen. You have Martin Sheen. You have all these people. They want to convince you what is right and what is truth. And then you have another litany. You have national religious leaders. For every wonderful national religious leader, we have ten nuts out there. Be careful. Be careful. Not everyone who calls himself a religious leader is neither. He's not religious and he's not a leader. He has a congregation of one. You ever seen that in Nightline when there's something going on and they want to ask a clergy what's going on? And you know, these very well-educated culture journalists, they're all dressed up and... We're going to go live right now to the the church of the second refrigeration up here. And uh, we're going to speak to Reverend Joe Pelota. Reverend Joe Pelota, what do you think? I think they're homosexuals and they should all go to hell. And uh, you sit there like, why is he talking like that? Yeah, they're nothing but homosexuals and they should be killed. They should going to go to hell. And you say to yourself, who is he? Why is he representing me? That's not the philosophy of Jesus. Jesus loves the homosexuals and the lesbians and the crackheads and the crimers. Jesus loves everyone, but he hates their sin. For us to become that judgmental is someone who misrepresenting the gospel. And he does so much damage. But I believe the media uses people like that. They will never get a Chuck Smith. They will never get a Billy Graham in there. I'm glad for Larry King. He got Pastor Greg Laurie last week. Wonderful. I haven't seen it, but I heard nothing but kudos. Wonderful. The Greg Laurie was right on. And and that Larry Larry King was saying, "Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That is cool. You see, we don't have that many responsible national religious leaders. What is the truth? Go home and verify everything I'm saying to you through Scripture because I too may be a false leader. Authenticated with the Word of God. We have lectures, we have doctors, we have popes, we have philosophers, we have scientists, we have poets, we have singers, we have movie stars, we got writers, we got publishers, we got former presidents, we got humanists, we got diet and nutrition experts, environmental, social, educational experts, and parental upbringing, life experience, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. What is the truth? Who are you listening to? You see, you listen to somebody. That's what makes you. Whether you're a believer or not, Someone's talking to you. Whether you say, you know what, I don't believe in God, I don't care about God. That's fine, but you got your philosophy from somewhere. You got your own little religion dialed in. That's the way it is for me. I don't care what you're saying, man. You know what, there is no God and God loves me regardless of where I am. See, you hear that from someone to formulate an idea and an assessment of God. This is why Paul says, stand in the truth, be truthful. And then also he says, verse 14, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. It is the righteousness of God. I ask you, when you became a Christian, you became a Christian because of your own righteousness? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. The Bible says to Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 64, 6, he says, but our human righteousness are compared to filthy rags. We have no righteousness. Isaiah says, listen to me, says those stubborn hearted who are far from righteousness. I bring, I bring my righteousness near. It shall be far off. My salvation shall not linger. linger. So how are we going to be saved? We're going to be saved by God's righteousness. And the old prophets were saying, how is that going to happen? Romans, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. And that's the next one. You notice in verse 15, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
I ask you, when you became a Christian, to spend it in the garden. And that's the next one. You notice in verse 15, that's the good news. It's the gospel. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16, I am one who what? Believes. For the Jew first and also came. It's the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to place. Of the gospel of peace. Power, find freedom, freedom and emancipation from guilt and shame. And he has come to bring you the right hand of reconciliation. That's the good news. To the gospel. Paul says in Romans chapter 116, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He said, For it is the power of God, God to what? Salvation for everyone who what? Believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, it's the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by what? By faith. It's amazing. There's a third century uh, um, rabbi by the name of Rabbi Simlai in the third century. In the third century, he's a very prolific writer, by the way. In, in the third century, he wrote and noted that Moses had given 365 prohibitions and 248 positive commands. But then he noted that David, in the book of Psalms, verse chapter 15, he reduced all these prohibitions and commands to 11. He also noted that Isaiah, in Isaiah 33, 14, and 15, he reduced them to 6. He also noted that Micah the prophet, in Micah 6, 8, he binds them all into 3. And finally he noted that Habakkuk reduced them all to 1, namely... The just shall live by faith. Can you imagine? From 365 provisions, 248 commands, he brought them down to just one command. The just shall live by faith. How did the gospel came about? Jesus sent his son. The first thing that Mark says in his gospel, the first thing, the first words of Jesus, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news. This is why you go into difficulty. You have to understand that the righteousness of God is of God, provided by God, dispensed by God, ordained by God, sustained by God, not by you. So you're saved. You're you're secure in that. And the gospel, the gospel of peace came to you. It is the word of truth that came to you. And then I'll skip, I'll skip number in in verse... um, in verse, uh, oh, where am I? Forgive me. Verse 16. He says, above all. What does that mean, above all? That means priority. Imperial. This is, this is the big one here. Our faith. We'll skip it and I'll come back. And he says also in verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. What does that mean, salvation? Well, it means that you've been forgiven. That you've been redeemed. That you've been justified and sanctified. That you have been free from guilt and shame through Jesus Christ. And that is the first thing we feel when we go through difficulty. You you begin to think, you know, am I really a Christian? Have you ever thought of that about yourself? Have you ever, because you did something, you thought something, or you're going through something, have you ever questioned your salvation? I'm looking at people like they don't know. How many have questioned their salvation? You're very honest, you're very brave to do that. A lot of people will not... They will not negotiate and come to that conclusion because somehow they feel that if they do that, uh, they're confessing something that is really awful. No. There are times when I question my salvation. Why? Because I'm a human being. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm not made out of rubber. I'm not made out of plastic. I'm not made out of metal. I bleed. My heart hurts. I'm a father. I have emotions. I see the toll, the emotional, the psychological. I see all this pain that comes upon me. Well, what am I supposed to do? And there are times in my, my loneliness. Loneliness. Pastor, you feel loneliness too? Yes. Yes. I'm being honest with you. I have a wife and five kids. How can you be lonely? I feel alone sometimes. 
Because we are. Nobody's going to run the race with you. It's your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's when God begins to speak to you. When you're alone. And he says, Mijo, I'm with you. I haven't left you. I remember when you were in Bo Heights, Mijo. All the way. You think I take you all this road just to belittle you, make fun of you? I don't work that way. I'm making something out of you. I see something. You see, he says, I'm the master potter. You're just a lump of clay. I'm going to make you into something beautiful. But you see, you've you got some areas in your life right now that they need to be shaped. Well, how are you going to do that? Oh, very easy. Ah, oh, but I don't like that. Yeah, you see, you've been praying that, that, that you want things to remove from your life. And you see, I see this, you see, and it, it still bothers me, you see. And, and, and you realize that hey, that's a horrible picture, but that's the reality. We feel like we're getting hit by our maker. Why are you hitting me? I'm molding you. I'm shaping you. If you think going around in circles in the clay table is bad, wait until I put you to the fire. What? It's going to be a fire? Oh, yeah. You see, you look ugly right now. But once you go to the fire, oh, you're going to glow. And you're going to become an expensive vessel. I don't like the fire. I think I want to leave. And you know what? Many people leave. Beautiful. God is in the middle of creating something. And they leave. And they bathmouth God. Yeah, man. He said, we're going to do something in my life. Yeah. He said, well, he hasn't finished the product. You know, they have those shops now where you can go paint the little pottery. You paint it and so forth. You know, and it looks dumb. It's dumb. But no matter what you do, once they glaze it and once they put it in the kiln, when it comes out, it's a work of art. It's a work of art. I still have some of my babes, some of my kids, they have little fingerprints on them. The little fingerprints. He says, Dad, when you drink, and you know, when you drink, you don't see anything, right? You have the liquid. But then when you finish it, the liquid goes down, you see the little fingerprints. Are you thinking of me now as you're drinking your cup? Dude, it's a dumb cup. But now it's a treasure cup. Memories. You see, they finished the product. And so he says, the gospel of peace. But what about your faith? You ever heard that expression? Don't lose the faith, man. Don't lose the faith. Paul the Apostle said, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. If Christ is not risen from the dead, he says, Our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. Jesus gets Simon in a very serious mode. And he said, Simon, Simon. You find this in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon. Yes, Lord. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as sweet. I mean, sweet Jesus. You know, it's like, Jesus, you call me to tell me that Satan is looking for me? Yes, he has your, your phone number. He has your address. He even stole your ID. And he's looking for you. But I'm one of you. I'm with you. Why, what, what is he done with me? Because exactly because you belong to me, he's after you. And what did Jesus tell Simon? He said this, But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Faith. Faith is so important. There are promises to each and every one of us, our faith. We have promises of God. We have 40 promises. Abundant life, the crown of life, a heavenly home, a new name, answers to prayer, comfort, companionship, deliverance, divine sonship, gifts of the Spirit, glory after death, God's protecting care, growth, guidance, knowledge, restoration, rest, spiritual fullness, spiritual treasures, understanding, victory, and it goes on. We have promises of God, but sometimes we lose sight of it. Circumstances want to destroy your faith. And once you take faith out of the equation of a life of an individual, We're left with nothing but fate. F-A-T-E. Whatever will be, will be. And we live in a quandary. We live in a madness. We live in darkness because we don't know where we're going. Faith is so important to us. We are told in Hebrews chapter 11, the whole chapter, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence not things are not seen. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, why should we hope for something we see? 
but we hope for the things unseen. We do not hope on the, on the temporal, but we hope on the eternal. John McCain, I close with this. John McCain, as you know, he's a U.S. Senator from Arizona. A real hero, in my opinion. I couldn't speak about him because he was running for president. But I read one of his books. It's called The Faith of My Fathers. He's a highly decorated man. He was shot down over Vietnam in 1967. And then when the, when the, when the, when the North Vietnamese found out that he was a high-profile individual, his father and grandfather were both admirals in the Navy, a powerhouse so they want to use him as a propaganda. They said, we'll let your son and grandson go as a gesture of our goodwill. John McCain was able to walk away free because of his status. John McCain says, I will not abandon a POWs. You release those that were arrested before me, and I'll go in that sequence of order according to the Geneva Convention. And he refused. For that, he was tortured for a year and a half, violently, torturedly, And he wrote in his book, In Faith of My Fathers, may I quote this? He said, Our senior officers always stress to us the three essential keys to resistance, which we were to keep uppermost in our mind, especially in moments when we were isolated or otherwise deprived of their guidance and the counsel of other prisoners. They were faith in God, faith in country, faith in your fellow prisoners. He says, we a resolute to keep this. No matter how barbaric, no matter how monstrous they become, we are going to keep faith in God, faith in country, faith in each other. We cannot lose that or else we'll become animals. And this is what he said. The purpose of our captors in humanity to us was nothing less than to force our descent into a world of total faithlessness. A world with no God, no country, no loyalty. Our faith will be replaced with simple reliance on the sufferings of our antagonists. Without faith, we will lose our dignity and live among our enemies as animals lived among their human masters. Faith in myself was important and remains important for my self-esteem. But I discover in prison that faith in human beings or faith in myself alone, separate from other more important allegiances, was ultimately no match for the cruelty that human beings could devise when they were entirely unencumbered by respect for the God-given dignity of man. This is the lesson I learned in prison. It is perhaps the most important lesson I have ever learned. Hungry, beaten, hurt, scared and alone, human beings can begin to feel that they are removed from God's love, a vast distance separating them from their Creator. The anguish can lead to resentment, to the awful despair that God has forsaken you. So he knew. The enemy, he says, was trying to take my faith away from me. They couldn't do it. I had faith in God. I had faith in country. Faith in my fellow officers. Another POW, Officer Colonel Ruthledge, he wrote that when he was being tortured, that he would sing that song over and over and over again. As he was being beaten, they took the socket of his arm and they would twist him for hours. And like a babbling idiot, he would just sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Over and over and over and over again. Do you know why? He says, because I did know other songs. But I remember that I had gone to a Sunday school. And I remember that from when I was a little boy. Teachers, if you don't think you have an impact on kids, he is now a retired general. He's retired. And he sings that song when he gets depressed, so when he gets bummed out. He sings that song to this day. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you. Jesus is the truth. He is the way. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you in the ER. He will never leave you abandoned. He will never leave you. He's a good God. He's your ally. He's your friend. Don't believe the lies. God loves you. He wants you to love him back by our faith in God. Don't lose your faith. Keep the faith. Let's stand. Father, truly you love us. For your word tells us so. 
For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, may your Holy Spirit touch those that are here that are going through a difficult time. May you strengthen their faith. May you strengthen their posture. May they hold on to their salvation. May they realize their righteousness belongs to you. Father, may you confirm their faith. And I ask you, my Lord, that they will maintain your truth, the truth that sets us free and emancipated from the talking heads in this world. May we not turn to the left nor to the right, but may we keep our eyes open upon you. And Father, for those who are feeling left out, would you please embrace them now? Bless them on their way home. Bless their marriages, their homes, their family, their children and grandchildren. Father, if we have good health, may we stop griping and rejoice in the good health that you've given us and pray for those that are not healthy. And Father, let us enjoy this day in you. With every eye closed and everyone praying, the head bowed. As we sing this song, whether you're in the fellowship hall or in the overflow room rather, or if you're here in the sanctuary, we like to create an opportunity for you to make things right with God. If you have never received Jesus Christ, today is an opportunity for you to do what I did, what many of us did here. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart. We shall be saved. And God will reconcile you. God will forgive you. Your new life can begin now. You want to receive Jesus Christ? I would ask you to step out of your seat. Out of your row. Come to the front here. Stand here in the tile with me. I'll pray with you. A small simple prayer. It's a prayer of a child. And that's all you need today. And if you want that, whether you're here or in the overflow room, go forward in the overflow room or forward here. There's pastors over there. There'll be pastors here. As we sing this song, and we let you go, if you would like to receive Jesus, whoever you are, today is that day. We'll sing this song. During this song, get out of your seats. I'll wait for you right here. But do come. God's been waiting for you. Let's worship the Lord. Anybody else? We'll wait for you. Don't wait too long. We'll wait for you. God bless you, man. Anybody else? Is it easy coming up here? Mm -hmm. Very hard. Very, very hard. Very hard. You say, but why? Your pride. And your unbelief. Can God really do that? 
We are living testimonies. Yes, he can. Jesus said, I am the truth. If I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Accept him in your heart. And that will be the true testimony of your belief. But you're going to go empty. And what's holding you is your embarrassment and your pride. Don't be embarrassed. We rejoice. That's why we clap. We get excited. Because we desire for you. That you may come to the rescue of God. That the madness in your life will stop. And that a freshness will come into your life. A new mind. A new heart. A new spirit. A refreshness that you cannot buy. In a drugstore. It is God given to you. Anyone else quickly. Whoever you are. Just come. We'll wait for you. I sent this more. And I just want to make sure you have that opportunity. Anybody else. Just make your way out. Right now. Whoever you are. The guy speaking to you. Just come out. You know who you are? Just come. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just come here, Mika. Anybody else? I sense there's more. And I'm pleading. I want to make sure. Anybody else? Don't go out of these doors mad dogging, man. You're going to get in your parking lot. You're going to go in the car. Satan's going to be there. Ah, you did good, man. That bald-headed guy talking trash. And he got you again. For once in your life, say, "Uh uh-uh. I'm not going to get ripped off. I've been ripped off all my life. This is my opportunity right here. And so it is. Make that opportunity count. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? As God speak to you. Don't let your pride, gentlemen. Don't let your pride mess with you. Humble yourself as a child. And you come. Anybody else will wait. Anybody else? Cool. All right. I plead it. How are you? Would you please repeat this simple prayer after me? Very simple. Pray after me. Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me a new person with a new heart, with a new mind, and a clean conscience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless.